I'm John Hyman, the director of the College Writing Program in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'd like tonight first to welcome my fellow uh, colleagues in the College of Arts and Sciences, especially the folks from the College Writing Program. But far more to the point, I'd like to share one more welcome from the College Writing Program to the class of 2018. I know you've been talking about Brooke Gladstone and the influencing machine in your classes for the past week or so. With the Writer as Witness event this evening, we continue the conversations that you've been having in class and online. It seems to me that with this book, Brooke is asking us to reconsider our own relationship to the media, even our own relationship to information in general. And she's happy to make us feel just a little bit uncomfortable in the process of doing that. Not a bad one-line description of a successful university education. Tonight, we're going to make sure there's plenty of time for your questions. A word on logistics. My colleagues, Professor Mary Switalski, Mary, stand up right here. Oh, by all means. <laughs> Professor Heather McDonald. And Professor Ariel Bernstein <laughs> will be among you with handheld microphones. So please don't be bashful about getting their attention when we turn to questions and answers. It's appropriate that we field your questions. In your college writing classes for the next four months, in all of your classes for the next four years, you'll be asking questions, lots of them. At every turn, I hope we will resist the temptation to think that we've found some right answer, much less, Brooke, an objective answer. With the Writer as Witness event tonight, we ignite the process. In a moment, I'll be turning over the program to Lynn Stallings, the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Studies and an Associate Professor in the Department of Mathematics. Now, that's a long, complicated title. In many ways, it comes down to this. Professor Stallings is in charge of the academic explorations I've mentioned. In a significant way, she is in charge of the main reason you came to AU, our undergraduate academic programs. Under her leadership, the Office of Undergrad Studies is dedicated to ensuring an unsurpassed education for all AU students through a broad range of programs and initiatives, living learning opportunities, Dr. Stallings oversees, for instance, the American University Honors Program, the Frederick Douglass Distinguished Scholars Program, as well as our General Education Program and University College, and the list goes on. A highly regarded member of the faculty, Dr. Stallings served as chair of our Faculty Senate in 2009 and was recognized in 2010 for her contributions to AU with the American U Award for Outstanding Service. Early on in Dr. Stallings' tenure at AU, she received the award for outstanding teaching. Before coming to AU, Dr. Stallings taught mathematics for grades eight through 12 in the Louisiana public school system, where she was the designated presidential awardee for excellence in mathematics teaching. She received her PhD from the University of Southern Mississippi, specializing in secondary mathematics education and research. I'm always delighted when I hear Lynn talk about the teaching of mathematics because she uses the word writing all the time to describe the best teaching practices. A personal note, finally. I often get to attend meetings with Lynn Stallings. Her standard guidance at these meetings is to make sure we're all considering what will be best for undergraduate education at American University. I've heard her say it many times but is that a good idea for our students? You are, to say the very least, in quite good hands. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lynn Stallings. Holy cow. Um, Y'all are the reason I come here. Uh, I love this university. I've been here for 25 years and uh, you are my hope for the future. So if you came here because of what this university has built for you, let me assure you that faculty are here 
because of you. You are what helped turn the lights on for us. And I want to thank you all for that. But it's my job to introduce our guest tonight. And this is a new age for introducing speakers at events, especially as one who's as prominent on the web as Brooke Gladstone. So rather than go through an introduction about what Brooke does and what she's accomplished, I think it is far better for her to know who you are, what you have done, and what you have accomplished. And I think there's no better way for me to tell her about that than to say that you have already researched her background. You have Googled, you've YouTubed, you've Tumblered. Oh, it, that hurts to say it. Uh, <laughs> and you may have even read the bio in the book. <laughs> but don't worry, don't worry if you've not invested the extra time that it takes to understand the messenger behind the message. If you don't know it by now, you will know it by the time you graduate from AU, that there's more to every story, that, is, that every written, filmed, and even directly witnessed experience should be considered with the understanding that we have our own lens for processing messages. I want to thank Brooke for providing a historical perspective of media as a messenger and as a message for augmenting that perspective with what we, as consumers of the message, bring to the table. Do we gobble it and embrace it by sharing it indiscriminately? Or do we reflect on how the message was delivered with all of its overt meetings, meanings and subtle nuances? And I want to thank Brooke for sharing her message through words and through graphic illustrations. Merely asking for an explanation of why graphics is like assuming that an explanation of a theatrical performance will serve in lieu of the visual experience that going to the performance will provide. Josh Neuf Neufeld has invited us to look beyond the words and think about how the illustrations convey their own messages. We have our own lens for viewing the world. Brooke and Josh provide for us the opportunity to try on a new pair of glasses. American University students, please welcome Brooke Gladstone. So that's what you look like. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys so much for inviting me here. It's really been an incredible experience. I mean, I've, I've done maybe half a dozen of these first reads kind of things, and I have never seen a group of students who re have read the text so closely and whose questions are so to the point. And uh, the same goes for the faculty, actually. The questions and the observations have been amazing. Uh, I'm going to speak only briefly because I know you guys have questions and I want to be able to answer them and I'm better in a Q&A form anyway. So, first of all, as I note in the book, in prehistoric times there were very, very few sources of information. In fact, one of the earliest sources was the, Orphic, the Oracle of Delphi in Greece. And the message printed on that shrine was the phrase, know thyself. And that's something that I've tried very hard to convey in the book, that you can't know anything if you don't know yourself, because you are wired to filter things like crazy. And a lot of that wiring is essential to your survival, but some of it really stands in the way of your understanding. And by you, I mean me too. We have a trusty old stock of opinions and when someone contradicts them or the facts contradict them, we are thrown into turmoil. The pragmatist William James observed that at first we may ignore the contradiction or will abuse the people who point them out. But a person cannot remain forever in doubt. So we shave a little bit off of one opinion and we tinker with another one 
to make them fit together while changing as little as possible. As James said, our minds, our minds thus grow in spots. And like grease spots, the spots spread, but we let them spread as little as possible. We keep unaltered as much of our old knowledge, as many of our old prejudices and beliefs as we can. Now, I offer in the book a, a whole pile of studies that suggest how much we're, our brains are wired and how we are planned to, really, basically, we are pre-programmed to see things in a certain way that is consistent and reasonable, even if it's wrong. Um, I wanted to talk about, in one example, which I don't have in the book, how potent this effect can be and why. Drew Weston is a psychology professor at Emory and he's author of the book Political Brain, The Role of Emotion in Deciding the Fate of the Nation. And he, and he described a 2006 fMRI study. Now, does everybody know what that is? An, an fMRI study is one where it's like an MRI because it takes an incredibly close sectional look at your brain but it gets to do it in real time. So as changes occur in various sections of the brain, they can see it happen then. So it's more like a video of your brain than just snapshots. Okay, so researchers used brain imaging scans to monitor the brain activity of committed Democrats and committed Republicans in the three months prior to the, to the 2004 presidential election. I mean, this is really good. Partisans were given a statement by their favorite candidate, and a statement by the opposing candidate, and a statement by a control figure. I think they picked Tom Hanks. Okay, so then they got second seg statements from each of these three people that showed a clear contradiction between the person's words and deeds suggesting that the candidate was being dishonest or pandering. In other words, your candidate, your opposing candidate, and Tom Hanks would say something, and then they'd say something that was either contradictory or they would be reported to do something that was in violation of their own stated ethical standards. Are you guys with me so far? Okay, so, when they got the contradiction from their opposing candidate that showed that the candidate was essentially a liar or a fraud, they had no problem dealing with that issue. When the control group, Tom Hanks, <laughs> was shown to be a liar or a fraud, they had no problem with that either. But, and this is the crucial part, in when they were confronting the contradiction or lie of their own candidate in the brain scan, there was no increased activity in the parts of the brain normally engaged in reasoning. It was with the other two, but not in the case of the lie of your preferred candidate. Nothing lit up in the reasoning part of the brain. Instead, the emotion circuits lit up. Once the partisans, the people who were the committed Democrats or the committed Republicans, uh, once those emotion uh, circuits lit up, in their brain, they are searching for ways, desperately searching for some way to reconcile the lie of their candidate. They're, they're absolutely going crazy to find a way to ignore information that could not be rationally discounted, at least according to the lighting up in the brain. Not only did the circuits that mediate negative emotions like sadness and disgust turn off, but subjects, once they had figured out how to lie to themselves about their candidate, got a reward, similar to what addicts receive when they get their fix they got a blast of dopamine. Essentially, once they lied to themselves, as a reward, they got a hit of cocaine. So that's what you're dealing with 
in your own, that is the kind of wiring you have to confront when you confront the media. Because as I, as I posit in the book, the media are a big mess of mirrors. And some of which we can say, oh, well, that's not me. But some of it in there is you. And it'll continue to be you if you don't constantly go through that aforementioned nauseating exercise of challenging your own beliefs. Now, the most common question I got was, how did I come to write this book, and how did I come to write this book this way? And we can talk about this more in the Q&A period, but I want to give you a kind of a brief summary of that, and, and then I'll stop. Initially, I wanted to write a science fiction comic book about two reporters in the year 2042. And I got DC Comics to, get me a, to give me a contract, and I was writing it, and I had my own editor, and we were going to get an illustrator, and then it turned out that I couldn't plot a book very well. And I sort of plotted myself into a corner. And my brilliant, wonderful editor at DC Comics suggested a few really insightful tweaks to fix this, this fictional manuscript, which basically involved starting from the beginning. So I went dark for a while. She couldn't find me. You're not answering my emails. You're not answering my emails. And then finally, she said, why don't you do a nonfiction book about what you know? And I was like, oh, no, not you, because Throughout the previous several years, I'd had a parade of editors and publishers and agents going through my office on the mistaken belief that people on National Public Radio sell books. And they wanted me to write a book because I had a selling platform. And honestly, they didn't care much about what it was, but it should be about media. And I had a real grudge against media books. I hated them, and I still kind of do, because I get basically four kinds in my office. I'd get a book that was really a liberal diatribe that was masquerading as a piece of, of media analysis, or a conservative diatribe doing the same thing, masquerading as a book about the media. I'd get the collapse of civilization book from the old guard that said, Digital media is destroying everything we know and, the li and, you know, life as we know it, and we're all going to hell in a handbasket. And then I got the fourth kind was, oh, what's ahead of us is a fantastic cyber utopia. We'll all be equal. We'll all tell the truth and kumbaya. So these books would come in, and I would just basically throw them against the wall. I, I, I didn't read them. I didn't like them, I felt like I already knew what they were going to say, and I would be damned if I would write a book that I didn't want to read. So, after Joan at DC Comics gave me this suggestion, and I reacted with intense negativity, I started thinking about whether or not I really had anything to say after 25 years of basically covering some form of this beat. And I realized that somehow, willy-nilly, ineluctably, I had started to formulate a kind of unified theory of media. I just began to put together pieces that at least explained to me how we got where we are now, why we're the way we are now, what does it mean, how dangerous is it, how wonderful is it, and in any case, what can we do about it? And I thought, you know, I think I know these things, but I have to prove them to myself. And to be honest with you, every single chapter of this book was written as I was designing the book. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit about how I worked with Josh, or else I can wait for the, uh, for the Q&A to do that. Basically, the manuscript, when it was finished, was about this thick. Because, as Josh told me on our first meeting, 
I can't read your mind. As, as anybody who knows this medium knows, you know, there's a difference between an illustrated book and a comic book. An illustrated book is a book where the pictures support the text. A comic book, a graphic formatted book with panels, is a book in which the pictures replace the text. Since I'm writing the book and Josh isn't, he can't come up with any of the pictures. I had to come up with all of them. He would tell me if they were unworkable or if they were unclear. He offered great critiques and he offered many suggestions, many of which I took. But fundamentally, I would send him a 150, 200 word description of what I wanted in it, where I wanted the voice balloons to be, where I wanted the strict narration to be, what I wanted in the picture, and here are three or four reference links, some of which you saw illustrated when you came in, of what picture I want you to base it on or what I want to see. And here's how they dressed during the Civil War. Here is what the, the statue of the Egyptian scribe looked like. Here is a cave painting of the ancient cities of uh, Guatemala and so on, the map of the Roman Empire, all of the pictures of the people in the book. They're all reference links that I sent to Josh along with the picture suggestions because he can't read my mind. And so that was the process. I would write a paragraph, then I would write it again with half as many words or shorter words, and then I would write it again after coming up with a picture that I could use to replace some of the text. And so that's fundamentally how the book was written. Again, why did I use that format is a whole other question, and maybe we can get to that in the Q&A, but I really wanted to make sure that I didn't go more than 25 minutes so that you guys could ask me your questions, because I've gotten really great questions. So take it away, and thank you. Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> you mentioned in your book that objectivity is an unreachable goal because no matter how much journalists and publicists or whoever, anybody making a written work, they always find a way to like sneak themselves in. So I was wondering, have you fallen short to this unreachable goal? If so, what is your bias and where is it most evidence in the text? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I'm aware of my biases. I am a liberal. <laughs> I am biased in favor of transparency. Generally, if there's a choice between more speech or less speech, I want more speech. I am not a First Amendment absolutist, but I approach that. I feel pretty strongly about that. Uh, in terms of have I ever been tripped up by them? Probably. I'm, I'm sure. I must have been. But because I know, or at least I'm aware of my biases and just the general wiring that I discuss so much in the book, I don't strive for objectivity. What I strive for is truthfulness and fairness. Not to argue to win the case, but to present the cases as fully as I can so that I can offer the listener the opportunity to make their own decision best based on my best and most honest presentation of all the important facts. I think that one can get bogged down in a, a semantic argument about you're saying objectivity doesn't exist, so you know, what's the point? Objectivity isn't important. What's important is trust, truthfulness, and fairness. And no matter how unavoidably wired and biased we may be. It is within all of our capabilities, whether we are producing media or consuming media or both, which is much more the case with all of you, uh, it is within all of our capabilities to be truthful and fair. Uh, do you want me to call on it or do you just want to eyeball? What do you think? 
All right, this woman in the red. Hmm. Who's going to get there first? Sorry for the wait. Um, okay, so do you think it's more the job of the uh, viewer or the audience to pick out what is truth for them or to sift through the bias? Or is it the media's job to present truth and... Um, it's always the job of the media to present information that is true and that is as fair as the people who are presenting the information can make it. But that doesn't mean that news consumers should trust that that's always going to happen. Mm -hmm. I think it's the responsibility of news consumers, just as they read the labels on their food, to take some care in mm -hmm. selecting what information they consume and especially what information they post or retweet. Uh, you know, just because something comes by, if you send it around, you know, there's that old saying that, you know, a lie makes it around the world, world faster than it takes to put your pants on. You know, it's just so fast and getting faster that it is everybody's responsibility, not either or, or both, but when there's so much more unmediated media, that just puts a greater responsibility on the news consumer to look into the news they're consuming. You know, are these reliable people? Have they been reliable in the past? Can check some of their sources. Usually there are links, or if there aren't links, at least there are names of people that they've quoted. You can go back and check their quotes. I mean, not in every story, but you could, uh, you could reverse report one story of a reporter that you think is really good and see whether or not you like their uh, process. And if you do, then even though no one is right all the time, you can feel confident that that person is out to be truthful and fair. So, yeah, you know, if you just retweet any piece of nonsense that, you know, comes through, you're not helping, you know. Uh, and that's, that's where I think it's, it's on all of us, uh, regardless of what our role is in the world. We're all part of this media ecosystem, so we shouldn't pollute it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, okay, right here in front, and, uh, and then I'll start looking in the back. Uh, throughout the book, you've sort of like expressed uh, frustrations about the media as well as its audience. In any time in your career, have you become disenchanted with the media? And if so, what pulled you back into it? And if not, what's kept you going? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm almost 60. I'm disenchanted with everything, pretty much. <laughs> Except my loving husband. Hi, Fred. But the thing is, is that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is a really sweet crowd. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that it's what we've got. We need it to be good. I mean, I'm really disenchanted with the way that we grow food in this country, you know? But you still have to eat, right? So what do you do? You try and go to reliable suppliers of food. And you try and support, to the extent that you can afford it, you know, uh, food that is grown the way that you feel it should be grown. Uh, you can't walk away from it. So I guess I've decided it is the better part of valor to, uh, to criticize it and to draw attention to my analysis of what's wrong, which of course isn't complete. It's just my best effort to be truthful and fair. And uh, yeah, sure, I'm disillusioned. And sometimes I feel really great about it. And lately I've been feeling especially great because I've been seeing regular people who aren't professional journalists taking back some of the power they've had for a really long time now, using it to speak back to the tropes that they don't like in the media. I'm thinking of uh, 
of that hashtag after uh, Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson, the if they gunned me down hashtag, which was in a, a way that news consumers responded to this picture that they chose of Michael Brown kind of scowling and doing what some people call a gang sign and some people call a peace sign, sort of, you know, this kind of thing. And uh, I know, I'm so cool. And, uh, and they just said, you know, there's so many people in that situation who are goofing out in front of the camera and then there's also a picture of them in their marine dress uniform, right? So which picture is the media going to take? That's the if they gunned me down hashtag. Which picture would you take if they gunned me down? Basically is what it means. And it's, it's wonderful because it puts the media, all of them on alert that they can't casually choose pictures to fit their own stereotypes. That's the kind of thing that makes me really happy. When uh, this reporter Foley last week, not the one that was beheaded this week, but last week was beheaded by ISIS, Reporters decided to create a hashtag campaign of not tweeting. And pr instead of providing picture, not tweeting the ISIS material. And so instead of tweeting the stills of his being killed or being terrified, they started a hashtag and started tweeting pictures of him at work and happy and relaxed. This is the narrative that we want of this reporter, this colleague. And it got so big that it was, tr in, within a couple of hours, it was trending from Washington, D.C. to Paris. I mean, that can happen so quickly. And reporters didn't do anything that regular people can, can't do. Everybody's got the same tools now. And I really think we're seeing a period where people can use them. And everyone is going to be more aware because there'll be a, m the feedback loop gets bigger and faster and that's how you get better media. So I, I actually feel quite positive. Uh, how about up there, black t-shirt, hand raised, stand up. Mm. <laughs> Don't hurt anybody. Mm. Mm. Um, I notice how you briefly um, talked about the rise of internet news sources, but I feel like since 2011, there's been a huge rise in these anti-establishment um, news sources like the Young Turks and the Alex Jones Show. And I was just wondering, like, has these um, news organizations in, um, in your opinion, um, are they um, kind of following the path of the media with their biases? Or do you think, as you outlined in, I don't remember exactly which portion of the book it was, but how the internet allows um, consumers to find other points of view that contradict um, their own. So and just to sum up, um, do you think these types of organizations are helpful to us or are they more harmful to us? Okay, I, I believe in more speech rather than less. Uh, however, I think both Young Turks, uh, which is a, you know, a, a very sort of lefty side of criticism, and Alex Jones, who's just batshit crazy, have been around... <laughs> have both been around long before 2011. Uh, you know, there, you know, these critiques have been, I, I think that the interesting trend is that some sites that were regarded as unserious or, or marginal have found really good business models and are starting to hire reporters. I mean, you've got the Huffington Post who's been hiring reporters and, and before then you had Talking Points Memo and then recently and most significantly, BuzzFeed, famous for listicles and cat pictures, have hired uh, investigative reporters that are being let go from much more established news organizations that are really feeling a crunch and they're, uh, and they're actually getting scoops. So what we're seeing is an evolution and, you know, I think we're going to come to a period where 
even within generally unreliable outlets, you can find some really great reporters, and among some really great outlets, you're gonna find a few not so good loose cannons, which is why I think it's worthwhile checking out people from time to time if you really like their work. Uh, I, you've got someone there, and then the guy in the blue shirt, but they just found someone. The trouble is, is that I'm very nearsighted, and I'm afraid of giving short shrift to the upper part. So. Now, you just talked about, um, like, how people should give an open view, keep an open mind. But I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. It's, it's uh, here, just hold it a little bit away. You talk about in. Uh, you just talked about how people should keep an open mind when discussing the media and stuff. But do you believe that because we're becoming so polarized today that the media perhaps believe they are giving an open view, but we see it as them being biased, such as maybe someone who is on Fox News believes they're giving the right opinion, but someone on the left disagrees. Conversely. MSNBC believes they're giving the right opinion, truly believes it, while someone on the right might disagree. Do you think that perhaps our polarization is blinding us, and is there a way we can kind of, you know, break this blind? Uh, there's no question that there is a lot more uh, polarization of a kind. Uh, the fact is, is that most of America is not really much more polarized than it was 20 years ago, but the, uh, the impact of the active minority of deeply polarized people is much greater than it used to be and uh, has its own, has, has some fairly influential news outlets. Uh, we, we do need to distinguish a little bit between commentary and punditry and news gathering, they all have different function. Um, you know, opinions are really the cheap fodder of cable, 24 hour cable news, because it's very inexpensive to produce and uh, you can have it on tap. Uh, it's, I, I can't really speak to the question of, do people think they're really right when really they're just being polarized and they're wrong. I mean, that's a sort of a question for the ages. We all uh, presumably think we're right. Most of us don't actively go out to lie. I mean, some of us do, and some of the people in the media do, but I would say the vast majority of people are motivated by what they sincerely believe to be true, even when the facts contradict them. You know, in the case of Lou Dobbs, the, the case in the book where he was making all of this, uh, taking and distorting these numbers about the increase in leprosy because of uh, immigration, which turned out to be utter nonsense and a com misreading of, uh, of government statistics, you know, I think his view was, well, maybe I did misread the statistics, but it's still true anyway, because it just feels true, you know, truthiness, like uh, Stephen Colbert talks about. Uh, the Bush administration, really believed there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I really believe that they did. Uh, they just wouldn't, uh, they just couldn't find them. And so they, they, tailored, they tailored the information that the American people received to reflect their honest belief there were weapons there that they just couldn't find proof of. I mean, it can lead you down a very dangerous path, but which is why one always has to question one's beliefs. But, you know, lying to oneself and lying to the American people is uh, an age-old tradition uh, that certainly didn't start with the current age of political polarization or with the internet. Uh, yes, this, this guy in the blue t-shirt, yeah, he's, he's been waiting a long time. And then I'll head over to, to, to that area. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know, from your perspective, what does national public radio do uniquely different from other partisan media sources? But also, what do you do as a, as a worker for NPR 
to prevent bias from interfering in objective news coverage? Uh, well, actually, I haven't worked for NPR for 14 years. They, it, NPR does distribute my program, but it's uh, produced by uh, WNYC, which is the biggest uh, public radio station in the system. Um, are there NYC fans here? Anyway, so, <laughs> um, you know, Radio Lab is similar, you know, and, and a variety of other shows. But in any case, I do think that one thing that uh, National Public Radio and Public Radio International and American Public Media and all of these uh, acronyms that basically represent public radio uh, provide is, uh, is really the only long form news on American radio. I mean, there really isn't anything else. I mean, it's Public Radio International that brings in the BBC. I mean, other than that, you go to AM and you listen to 1010 10 Winds or, you know, tw give me 22 minutes and we'll give you the world. It's just, it's the only place where it happens on radio and it turns out people still like to listen to the radio. It's one of those mediums that was supposed to have died, you know, half a century ago and still seems to be kicking along. Uh, up there, uh, green, uh, green tank top, yeah. Hi. Mm -hmm. You discuss in your nonfiction graphic novel quite a few times the idea of journalists uncovering government secrets and scandals and most importantly censorship, especially political censorship. I wanted to ask your opinion on the Edward Snowden case. Yeah, okay. Um, Edward Snowden. He did America a great service by directing, <laughs> he did America a great service by directing our attention to surveillance that was excessive and intrusive and uh, likely illegal. Uh, a lot of his other um, revelations were of no practical value to uh, the public and didn't really uh, ex didn't really show law breaking, at least American law breaking. Uh, I think that a whistleblower is somebody within the government who tries to work through government sources, uh, government structures first to correct a problem and when they can't do it, then they take it to the public. Uh, Snowden was not strictly speaking by that definition a whistleblower. Uh, he was certainly a leaker. Uh, his initial leaks were really useful and the dribs and drabs that have come after that, I am, I'm really mystified if it's, if it's purely uh, sort of selfless patriotic gesture on his part. Um, you know, it's a mixed bag. I think, it, I think the initial leak was really, really something. Since then, a lot of what's been going on is, uh, is a great mystery to me. And uh, a lot of what he said is, uh, is rather disturbing. We could go into a, a lot of detail on that, but uh, I guess you could say that I am, I am both grateful and profoundly ambivalent. Uh, Somebody from that section, have I missed somebody? Okay, we're okay then. All right, right here. Mm -hmm. Sorry not to scare you. Okay, hi. Um, <laughs> I was kind of talking about your book. I had a question on, like in regards to taking on the feat of writing graphic novel. Um, Sorry, say, say the second part. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay, is that good? You see, it's a very uh, unidirectional mic, so if you go like that, then it really can't be heard. So that's why <laughs> no. you have to do that. Okay. <laughs> um, in, in terms of writing a nonfiction graphic novel, were you intimidated at all in writing a nonfiction graphic novel? Because you can either not be taken seriously enough, or books like um, Mouse, you know, has been taken really seriously and kind of gone really big. So were you nervous or intimidated at all? Was I, concerned, was I concerned that yeah. it, they wouldn't take it seriously? Yeah. 
uh, sure, I had that concern, but it wasn't really enough to deter me. Um, this, unfortunately, was unlike the really successful nonfiction uh, graphic books in that it, it wasn't a memoir or an, uh, a, a narrative. It was an argument, it was a thesis, and uh, so there wasn't a chronology to hang on to. In fact, it was a pretty dense thesis in a lot of ways. And I only, and my best skill, the one in which I have the most confidence, is radio. And this form was as close as I could get to radio. And I could, if anybody's interested, I could explain that in greater detail, but this was visual radio. I'm sorry. Oh, should I explain it in greater detail? <laughs> it's, uh, it seems a little uh, counterintuitive because radio is the uh, medium without pictures, but the fact is that in ra radio, if you listen to it, is extremely intimate, much more so than uh, than reading like a, like a newspaper article or uh, watching television. When you read uh, a newspaper article, the writer generally is absent uh, by convention. If you look at a TV, you feel like there's a thousand, maybe a million, maybe 10 million other people watching the sh same program with you. When you're listening to the radio, there's this illusion of one-to-one. -one. You can almost feel the breath of the correspondent or the anchor on your cheek. Uh, when uh, Al Franken started to do his radio show on Air America, he went to a uh, longtime public radio guy, Garrison Keeler, fellow Minnesotan for advice, who told him that, you know, imagine that the person you're talking to is sitting in your lap. Uh, that's how close it is. Now, you're really reliant on that voice because you're blind. You need that voice to lead you through this complex thicket of information or into this strange land or introducing you to all these people and you need that person. You want to understand that person and you identify with that person at least to the extent that they have to function as your surrogate. And in the way that I've always done radio, I've tried to function as the listener surrogate. When dealing with a non-chronological, non-sequential argument which goes back to the Stone Age and into the future and then back again and further again and, you know, changing, uh, you know, changing tack every few pages, I thought I could do it better the way that I do it on the radio, which is to talk to the person, in this case with balloons coming out of my mouth, and looking them in the eye to the greatest extent that I could to make that connection. Uh, the, uh, the avatar that we used was lacking detail because uh, the fewer details you have, the more, I, you know, the more you can project yourself upon that person. I mean, that's part of the secret of, uh, of anime. So uh, I chose a very simple avatar, and that avatar would transform according to events and hopefully bring you guys, bring the reader along for the ride. Also rhythm, rhythm and pacing, sound, text, sound to me is like the picture. Uh, the text uh, is, is me speaking, and then the voices of other people speaking. I could almost structure it like a radio piece even building in microseconds of rest. One piece of advice that Art Spiegelman gave me when I spoke to him was, always end your thought at the bottom of the page. That was kind of a difficult thing to do because sometimes I thought I'd said what I wanted to say and it was the middle of the page. So I'd either expand or I would shrink so that people could have just that microsecond of rest when leaving the bottom of one page and going to the top of another at the end of an idea. So uh, that was Art Spiegelman's most useful piece of advice to me. The, the other prominent piece of advice uh, wasn't very useful, which was, don't ever collaborate. So I couldn't use that one. Um, all right. Uh, 
I don't know. Uh, back there. You guys fight it out. You'll be next. Hi. Um, you emphasized a lot on fairness and uh, Wait, bias. I don't even see you. Where are you? Raise your hand. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> um, you emphasize a lot on fairness and bias. Uh, do you think that there are instances where there is a clear right and a clear wrong, or there are bills and issues that are good and that are bad? And if there are, do you think, uh, what do you think the role is in the media in uh, letting viewers know, I guess, in a way, their bias of what could be right or what could be wrong. Do I think that there is a clear yes or a, I mean, a clear rightness and a clear wrongness to certain issues? Yeah, or like uh, uh, a benefit for bills. Yeah, I mean, there is that issue. Uh, one of the biases I talk about is fairness bias, when there's a, a preponderance of evidence that one side is right and only very little bit of evidence that the other side is right. Do you give them equal time to give the illusion of equality while misleading the reader that it is uh, an equal argument between the two? I think that it's very risky for reporters to come off as if they prejudged an issue, but I think it is, I think it is pusillanimous of reporters, <laughs> cowardly, for them not to face up to the fact that there are certain issues that have been decided even if people want to keep fighting that war over and over again. Uh, the classic example everybody gives is global warming where you've got, you know, huge preponderance of scientific evidence on one side and a sliver of evidence, much of which is funded by, believe it or not, the tobacco companies, not even the oil companies, but they're, they are propagating this notion of junk science and uh, so they are supportive of, uh, of the idea that global warming is somehow the product of junk science. Uh, so they've joined forces. But, you know, that's one where you're not being honest or fair if you present uh, a reader or a listener with an argument that seems to be equally balanced on both sides when, in fact, that is not the case. Most issues, it's difficult to find a right and wrong. The deeper you dig into something, the more complicated and the more conditional and the more shades of gray start to emerge. Um, so I don't think that reporters should be prejudging every issue. Uh, few, few journalists, even ones who really know their beat, have that degree of expertise and I wouldn't uh, be comfortable with a journalist who uh, would be making those decisions uh, in that way. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the best I can do. Um, based on your experience analyzing the media, which type of media bias do you feel is the most convincing and why? What type of media bias do I think is most convincing? <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. Um, you mean the one that's most pervasive? Yes. Uh, that yes? Works. That works, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, well, I think the need for things to be new is the most persuasive. There are, the first one that I mention, which I call commercial bias, I should really call it newness bias or something like that because uh, you know, news is defined as anything that's new. So if a story's been told before, no matter how earth-shaking that story is, there's a resistance to go back to it. Whereas a story that uh, is shiny and new, even if it involves one police car following another police car down a road in California somewhere, uh, you know, is what gets played. Uh, I think that there is uh, there's a need for a reordering of priorities and something being new should not be at the top of the list. And so I think that's probably the most pervasive one. Uh, yeah, um, you guys should probably just get people in advance and that makes it easier. Uh, okay, um, 
how about getting somebody here now, and then Ariel, you get somebody for after that, and that way we don't have to waste time running around. Okay. Oh. 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 <laughs> this person has a cheering section. So uh, I'm a big fan of Neil Postman, and you'll hear this in my question. Uh, but you'll notice that BuzzFeed mixes uh, entertainment with news. Uh, I, I mean, literally, like, the buttons for entertainment and news are, like, right next to each other on their website. Um, and do you think that doing this, this mixture, uh, sort of turns our, our news into an entertainment format and uh, makes that the goal, to entertain rather to educate? than to educate and to inform. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's always been that way. I mean, there was a sort of anomalous middle part of the century where things changed for a while. But entertainment and uh, information have always been combined. And even though I know Neil Postman said and Neil Postman deeply believed that, you know, the creation, being able to get news from afar, from the telegraph, created an environment in which news that could not be acted on was not local, was therefore entertainment. You know, like I quote C.K. Chesterton at the end of the book and saying, you know, news is saying uh, Lord George is dead to a bunch of people who never knew Lord George was alive, right? So, and that's what Neil Postman said, is that, hey, the minute you start hearing stories about some people far away that have nothing to do with you, and you can't act on it, and it's not in your local community, that is entertainment. You know, basically, if you extrapolate from Postman's argument, and he was a brilliant man, but if you extrapolate from that argument, then, uh, then you might think all international news or any technology starting since the telegraph has hurt our, uh, uh, our ability to be informed. I don't believe that's true. And I don't know what he would say now because he's been dead during the, you know, the real height of the development of the internet. But the, uh, but the fact of the matter is, A, we know that news from afar affects us and that our actions affect news from afar. This is a really global economy and a global culture. So, so that wasn't true nearly so much in the 70s. Uh, so that's number one. And, and number two, our ability to participate in these areas is so much greater on a, on a granular level. Every individual can act. And that just doesn't mean pressing a, a like button. I mean, can do a lot more than that. Raise money, travel, d do this kind of thing. We have a short attention spans, but we can do that. Uh, so getting back to your BuzzFeed story, you know, BuzzFeed has a business model that works for BuzzFeed. Not everybody does that, but everybody is experimenting with different kinds of advertising. And you know how annoying it is when you're reading an article and then suddenly you, you hit a, some highlighted thing that says, you know, refrigerator and then you know suddenly if you're not careful you get dumped into an ad for a refrigerator somewhere it's it's annoying and it's uh, and it's concerning as well because we know that a lot of these things are designed simply to attract clicks clickbait is you know the it, a lot of people regard that as sort of the hope for the future I really believe the hope for the future is people start paying for media again and then they get quality stuff, and they don't have to put up with all of this other crap. You know, even BuzzFeed is starting to do decent work sometimes. Uh, okay, you and then you, okay? That way, so that guy there in the gray t-shirt, and, and then this person, and then that person, okay? Because I already said. And we have about 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know. I know um, these guys had things to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you, talked a you talked briefly about how it's the consumer's responsibility, the reader's responsibility to know where our information is coming from. 
And um, in, your, in your book, you also talked about the bias of, of media to try and always find the next progressive story, so covering stories that seem to be kind of the hot topic. And uh, maybe that was kind of a, a commentary on our attention economies that we're always looking for the next story. But one of the things, um, or my question is, if we're to believe your thesis that the media is simply a reflection of our own perceptions of the world in itself, how are we supposed to put pressure on the media to always um, cover stories in their entirety? So for example, the Syrian humanitarian crisis that has been going on for three years now, the bulk of media coverage only happened during last year in August during the chemical weapons attack, and we I'm haven't sorry, seen- what story is this? Pardon? What story are you talking about? The Syrian humanitarian crisis. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And the bulk of media coverage only occurred in August of last year during the chemical weapons attack. So how are we supposed to put pressure on media if the media is only a reflection of our own perceptions and we can't possibly know what so story should be covered? So you're saying is this a closed circle? You yes. know, are we, you know, if we don't know, then how can we put pressure on the media to provide us with the information we don't know is happening to begin and with? And also, how can we put pressure on the media to ensure that stories aren't sensationalized? Well, as to the first point, I, I would just turn it back on you and say, if you care about Syria, there are thousands of places to look for, informa to look for information about Syria. Uh, maybe the four networks weren't covering it. Maybe you didn't even see it in the Times, but you could find it on the BBC, and you could find it on lots of responsible websites and foreign policy and Mideast reports. Uh, once you know that information is, then you can start, uh, you know, uh, rattling the, uh, the larger news outlets to cover those things by organizing uh, letter writing campaigns. Uh, these things sound lame, but I have to tell you, as somebody who works in the media, if there are enough of them, it really works. Uh, in terms of sensationalizing, you speak back to the media, send a note saying, you know, what it is you object to. I suggest that you do it in a civil way and don't use words like, you know, asshole and stuff like that because what I can tell you that when I get letters like that, after the first, the second I get cursed at, I just trash it. I, as far as I'm concerned, they've lost the right to my attention by uh, abusing me. So people who are incensed and in a rage when they write me, uh, aren't going to get a fair hearing. They should take a deep breath and explain in a calm, in a calm way what's bothering them. So, but you can talk back now. People are listening. They really care because they know, uh, as they never have before, that uh, y you matter. It also, as I said, helps to pay for the stuff you think is good. Uh, you know, the, almost all the good foreign media outlets out there, like Global po Post, for instance, uh, are, they need contributions. And if there are places that you go to, give them a contribution. That is the only way to prevent uh, the clickbait, which results in sensationalizing and in providing only the kind of information that America cares about, like if your refrigerator is going to kill you, and, you know, details 11. I mean, really, you have to sort of, it, it's a pain. I know, I just wish they could be exactly the way that you'd want them to be and reflect your priorities right out of the box. I wish, I wish they could, but they won't, because they want, they need money. And uh, that's, you know, and some of them really don't care how they get it, and some of them do, but they're not getting that much money. I mean, the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the LA Times, these, these all used to have way more foreign bureaus than they have now. And that's because, uh, you know, Craigslist took away the classified ads. The, uh, the people who uh, are willing to subscribe to those papers have already gotten price rises, and they've paid. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, the people who are reading online aren't paying. So, you know. Brooke, we have time for one more question right uh, here. I guess that person there, or this person, two more questions. Two more. Okay. Okay, should I? All right, uh, her, then you, okay? You'll be the last? All right, are you okay or are you nervous? Do you want to go now? No. Okay. Okay, so my question is, um, you said that you had a really, really thick manuscript. What? 
you said that you had a really thick manuscript, that you had like a huge, you know, large book. And I wanted to know, was there any idea in particular that like was left out that you were really sad was left out? You just couldn't put it in there? Yeah. And if you could share it with part, us. Right another now. part of the problem of collaborating is that there is, uh, you know, there are two different work styles. There's the artist and there's the journalist. And there's one kind of style that believes in deadlines and another kind that doesn't care if they blow through deadlines. So I had to drop the, you'll be sad to know, I had to drop the chapter because we didn't have time to illustrate it on uh, how pornography has been the driver of communications media, starting with, uh, starting with uh, the Gutenberg Press. One day I'll bring that out, but, and we did have some, uh, you know, it was, it was sketched, but it wasn't uh, inked and he just did not have time, so we let it out. Maybe it wouldn't have been picked for this, uh, cl this thing if it had been. It, there were breasts in it. Okay. Um. Oh. One more question. I'm sorry, one more. One more question, okay, everybody? That's it. Go, go. <laughs> uh, hi. In your section on war, you mentioned the military censoring journalists during wartime. Mm -hmm. And in light of the recent, uh, the recent rumors that NBC pulled a journalist out of Gaza for being too pro-Palestinian, uh, do you think that network censorship is as dangerous as military censorship or the same? That what is dangerous to censorship? Network censorship. That network censorship is as dangerous as military. I'm still not government. hearing that. Okay. Um, do you think that network censorship oh, is network as dangerous? Yeah. Okay. Uh, network censorship. It is true that they pulled that, uh, that, um, correspondent who was of Egyptian descent out of uh, Gaza, uh, then they put him back in. So, you know, there was a backlash and that, you know, Israel, Gaza, the territories, that is just a subject that reporters can never win on. Uh, NBC behaved uh, badly and NBC rushed to correct its mistake. And as far as I'm concerned, there's a happy ending to that story <laughs> because, uh, you know, they had a somewhat diverse, finally, uh, you know, group of correspondents handling that. And uh, when he did his stories and some people didn't like it and they got some pressure and they pulled him out and then he got some more pressure and they put him back in. And that's what I talk, that's what I mean about, you know, power to the people. It gets, it gets results now where it didn't used to. So it's a good point. It's a good idea to end on. So thank you. And thank you all very much. Thank you, Brooke. Mm.